today. Thanks be to God who causes us to triumph in his name. Our victory is in you and you alone. The truth is, Lord, no matter the unsettling and uncertain times we're in, you are all we need. You are all sufficient. You are more than enough. So we just make that our prayer today. We make that our confession and our prayer. Father, we just want more of you.
when there's more of you and less of me oh jesus you are all i need so give me more of you and less of me That last song is such a great anthem for the time that we're in. God, give me more of you and less of me. That is the formula, by the way, to have a peaceful and purposeful life. Before we get into the message today though, I wanna just have a family moment with you as a church. I know so many of us are anxious to gather back together on our physical campuses to worship. And listen, no one wants that maybe more than me. I mean, I'm preaching to an empty room, but I wanna ask you to be patient with us as we look for the right timeline to gather back together physically on our campuses. Some of you are new. You've actually never been to one of our 10 CCV campuses across the valley. But if you have been, you know our campuses are designed for community. We have play areas for kids, coffee shops, barbecue grills, food service, and amazing seating areas all across our campuses because we believe doing life in community is so important. But what that means is with our size and strategy, our church doesn't work well with strict social distancing. Take, for example, our kids' buildings. Kids don't even know how to practice social distancing. So as you begin to hear terms like reopening, you hear restaurants reopening, businesses, even smaller churches, I want to ask you to be patient and trust us as we work on the right timeline to gather back together physically at CCV. We're gonna do that in a responsible way that serves our church and city really well. In a spirit of transparency, what I will always give you, from what I can see right now working directly with our governor and medical experts in our community, we will not be gathering physically for weekend services soon. We don't know an exact date, but we commit to keeping you regularly updated. But remember, our church is never closed. The church is not a building. We're still doing ministry, preaching God's word and seeing lives change like never before. Our church is not closed. So CCV, hang in there. We will get through this. We'll not only get through this, we'll be stronger on the other side of it. Now you might ask, what will our first step be to gather back together? Our first step will be gathering people in small groups in people's homes to watch the service together. That will be our first step. 
That's why it's so important for you to be a part of a CCV small group now. Now, under our current state guidelines, all of our small groups are meeting over Zoom video conferencing right now. But as those guidelines open up, we wanna ask all groups that are able to come back together to meet in homes, to do life together. So if you aren't a part of a CCV group, there's never been a better time to join than right now. You can simply text the word CONNECT to 72020 and we will send you all the CCV groups that meet around you that you can choose from. Many of them are brand new, so try one out. It's never been so simple to join a group. If you aren't a part of one, I'm challenging you to sign up today. Now, let me give you one more update. Not only is next weekend Mother's Day, but we have one of the most sought after speakers in the entire country coming to speak next weekend. Her name is Lisa Turkhurst. Lisa leads Proverbs 31 Ministries. She's a number one New York Times bestselling author and the message she's going to bring is so powerful. So as you join us next weekend, invite your mom, invite everybody you know, because we also have a few other fun surprises in store for you. But right now, open up your CCV mobile app, pull open the notes section. We're continuing our series, Good Medicine. Our teaching pastor, Mark Moore, is here with a message that is so good. Let's join in with him right now. What do you see? Uh, Most people will see the silhouette of a man wearing glasses, which is natural because your brain is designed to recognize facial features. But what if we shifted the perspective just slightly? Now, what do you see? It's a word, liar, (laughs) because your eyes can deceive you. What you expect to see is what you are able to see. But if you change your perspective, you can change your field of vision. Now, we've heard that this virus is words like unprecedented, unique, never before. Really? What if I showed you a different photo that gave you a different perspective? Between 1918 and 1920, because of the Spanish flu, We were in a very similar situation as now. There were closures of churches and schools and businesses and entertainments. We have been here before, including the mandate to wear masks in public. In fact, back then they said, you have to wear a mask or go to jail. We've been here before. And I want to use this situation as a parable for an important biblical principle. And if I were to summarize the whole sermon in a single sentence, I would say this. If you only look around you and don't look behind you, you won't see what's ahead of you. The series we're in is called Good Medicine. We're talking about the power of pain, not the problem of pain, but the power of pain to bring progress into your life. Over the last couple of weeks, Ashley has been teaching us that pain is a part of progress always. And you know this. Your greatest gains in life come often through some of the greatest pain that you've experienced. So what I wanna do is lay a verse on the table. And we're just gonna do a couple of laps around the verse. It comes from Romans chapter eight, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, and who were called according to his purpose. God never wastes a pain. And if you read the next couple of verses, you realize what he's talking about ultimately is your salvation. There will come a day when there is no crying, no tears, no disease, no war, no pain. But we're not there yet. And our God is so good that not only will he bring out of your pain, the goodness of salvation, but along the way, right here, right now, God is going to take your deepest pain and bring good out of it. And what I'd, what I'd like to do is 
take this verse and lay it next to a biography of the Old Testament. In the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, there was a man named Joseph. He was one of the 12 leaders of the tribes of Israel. His father was Jacob, also called Israel. This is where it all began. Now, he was the 11th of 12 children. His younger brother wouldn't be born until long after he left home. But it started like this. His mother gave birth to him. He was the only child of his mother who was the favorite wife of his father. <laughs> Obviously, this family has some triage to deal with. So his stepbrothers all hated him because, well, I had a younger brother and my older brother and I knew that he was the favorite of my mother. Now she's never admitted that, but we just knew. Joseph's father didn't even try to hide it. In fact, he made a jacket just for his one son, the, the son of his favorite wife. That was this multicolored coat and he wore it with pride. Not just with pride, he was arrogant about it, just strutting, the, you know, I got the coat and the brothers don't have the coat. They hated him for it. When he was 17 years old, he's out watching the sheep with his brothers and he's, again, irritating them because he's an arrogant younger brother, parents' favorite and all that. He has a dream. There's a lot of dreams in this story. In this particular dream uh, was about sheaves. You know how farmers gather the crops and they bundle the grain together. And the 10 sheaves bowed down to his one sheave. And he was dumb enough to tell his brothers about the dream, which is gonna go over about as well as a hot dog at Hanukkah. They don't think they will ever bow to their baby brother, even if he is mom and dad's favorite. Oh, then he has another dream. Not about sheaves, but about stars and the sun and the moon. And they all bow down to him. Now the sun and the moon, that represents mom and dad. And even mom and dad, though they played favors with Joseph, said, uh, that's a little too far. You just back up that truck. But that was the dream that Joseph had. It made his brother so mad that they determined right then and there, we are going to kill him. And one day he came out to the flock of sheep and his brothers threw him in a pit and they, they were, they were gonna kill him. The oldest brother, Reuben, came along and said, guys, guys, we can't kill our brother. Let's sell him into slavery, which I guess is better, but still, that's messed up. These camel caravan came by, and so they sold their brother on the Midianites' way to Egypt. And he, when he got to Egypt, he was purchased, this is actually fortunate, by a man named Potiphar. Potiphar was a high-ranking official in the Egyptian government. And before long, this young man, no longer a teenager, in his early 20s, is raising up in the hierarchy of Potiphar's house. He gets to be in charge of the whole house. Like, he runs the place. Potiphar doesn't have to worry about anything. And one day, Joseph was in the house taking care of business, and Potiphar's wife grabbed a hold of his jacket. And she's not even subtle with this. She says, come to bed with me. I mean, that's one bold cougar right there. You, you, and he just, no, I can't. Now, Joseph has his flaws, but it's not a moral flaw. He said in this moment, this is important, how could I sin against my master Potiphar or against my God? He somehow has a moral core that points true north to his God. Well, she calls foul. You know, the Bible says, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Okay, actually the Bible doesn't really say that, but it should, it's God's honest truth. And she goes to Potiphar and says, Potiphar, he tried to rape me. Totally not true. But what's Potiphar gonna do? He takes Joseph and throws him into prison. And I imagine if I were Joseph, I would be thinking, where is God now? He gave me this dream that my brothers would bow down to me, but they sold me into slavery. And now I'm as good as dead in a prison in Egypt. But you can't keep a good man down. And before long, Joseph had risen to the top of the food chain in the prison. The warden himself had Joseph running the prison. Now, he's still a prisoner but he has quite a bit of flexibility and into this prison is thrown a baker and a cup bearer. Now a cup bearer was an, an ancient job, it's kind of like a sommelier that tastes wine for the king. 
Not to see if it's quality, but to see if it's poisoned. That was the quickest way to get rid of a ruler you didn't like. So both of them get crosswise with the Pharaoh of Egypt to get themselves thrown into prison. And one day they have a dream. The sommelier has a dream about three vines. And they grow up and instantly they produce these luscious clusters of grapes. And he takes the grapes and he uh, puts them underfoot and makes wine out of it and gives it to the king. That was his dream. Has no clue what it means. And Joseph says, well, I know what that means. The three vines are three days. And in three days, you are going to be restored to your position as cupbearer. Remember me when you come back to power. He didn't. The baker said, well, my dream, I had three baskets of bread on my head. And the, the top basket, the birds of the air kept coming and picking the bread out of the basket. And Joseph says, oh, I know what that means. And you're not gonna like it. The three baskets are three days. And the birds represent death. You were gonna die by your head. And three days later, sure enough, he was hanged. And the cupbearer forgot all about Joseph in the palace. A year goes by, two years go by, Pharaoh has a dream. I told you there's a lot of dreams in this story. Pharaoh's dream was weird. You know, he's sitting by the Nile and in his dream, these seven cows come up out of the Nile. They are fat, sleek, beautiful cows. And right behind them come these scrawny, nappy cows. They're, 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 they're terrible, sickly cows. And the sickly cows actually cannibalize, this is bovine cannibalism, they cannibalize the other good cows. And nobody could figure out what it meant. Now, Pharaoh had magicians and, and enchanters in his palace that were supposed to be able to interpret dreams. They couldn't. And it was then that the sommelier remembered, oh, I know a guy, but he's back in prison. So they raced and got jo Joseph out of prison, quick shower and a shave, and he's standing in regal robes in front of the most powerful man on earth. And Joseph said, I know what the dream means. There's gonna be seven years of plenty. Your crops are going to be outrageous. And it's gonna be followed by seven years of famine. And Joseph didn't just interpret the dream. He actually laid out a strategy for how to capitalize on the famine. He said, if you will put back a certain percentage of the good crops, when you get into the famine, you will not only be able to feed all your people and obviously raise their taxes for the food they're getting from you, you will be the source of salvation to all the other nations around. You can become the richest man on earth. Pharaoh liked the sound of that and actually put Joseph in charge of everything. Now talk about a rags to riches story. He went from the pit of a prison to the prince's house, he was number two in all of Egypt. As the years rolled by, it, it came about just as the dream had predicted, seven years of feasting, seven years of famine. In the middle of the famine, these other nations began sending delegates to Egypt. Please sell us some of your grain. And one of the delegations, they all went to Joseph. One of them had 10 brothers who came from Israel they have no chance of recognizing Joseph. He's changed too much. He's wearing different clothes. He looks like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. He walks like an Egyptian. But he recognized them. And he actually toyed with them. You ought to read the story, Genesis 37 through 50. It's, it's really interesting. But here's the bottom line. At the end of the story, he reveals himself to his brothers and says, it's me, Joseph. They can't believe it, nor do they want to believe it. After all, they thought he was dead and they were alive and now he's alive and they're about to be dead. So they thought. But I want you to listen in chapter 50, verse 20 of Genesis, Joseph's heart. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of, of many lives. And that's what God has in store for you. I don't know what the pain is that you're feeling. Maybe, maybe it's an economic pain of a job loss. Maybe you did get the virus. Perhaps for you, the pain is a relationship. Those are always the worst kinds of pain. Whatever your pain, 
just know if you lay Genesis 50 verse 20 next to Romans 8 verse 28, you have a God that will never waste a pain. Your God will use the pain that you're in right now for his glory. And you know this, pain is powerful good medicine. Pain is what ultimately gives you the greatest gains of your life. And my guess is that you are experiencing that right now, even during this COVID crisis. For me, my neighbors, I've noticed they're more compassionate than they've ever been. We are taking compassionate care of our neighbors like never before. They are uh, checking in on each other. They are looking over the fence. They're bringing food to one another. This is good time for compassion. And not just compassion. Have you noticed that people are more grateful? Signs for first responders, for those who are in the medical community. Our gratitude is heightened because of the pain that we're experiencing. And it's not just that we are more grateful people, which we are, and that's good. We're actually more generous people. There's a couple that I know, they're newlyweds and she's about to give birth to their first child. Neither of them had lost their job, but they got this check from the federal government. And they decided uh, we didn't ask for that money. We don't need that money. So obviously God gave it to us to give it away. Now, how many of you, if you were newlyweds with a child on the way, would give away a federal grant? But they did. They found a family. I wish you could have been there. It was a family who really did need it. And the joy on their faces. I'm not talking about the faces of the family that received it. Obviously, they were overjoyed. But the joy of generosity was an overwhelming moment for me. And my wife and I actually, we looked at what that young couple did and said, we got to catch up to their generosity because of what a great example it was. So how can we make sure that our pain leads to progress? So that we don't waste a pain like our God who doesn't waste a pain. I just want to give three reflections right now. And it has to do with our perspective of time. The first one is your own perspective. You have to learn to look past your present pain. And that's difficult because when you're in pain, like you get locked in that moment. But if you think about Joseph, when he was in the pit that his brothers threw him, like he was in the pit. When he was in the prison, after Potiphar's wife accused him, he was in the prison. But he didn't get stuck in the present pain. He somehow was able to look forward to a future where his pain could bring salvation to other people. You know, I had a, an experience in my very first ministry. And it's not, like, it's not the major pain that other people have had. But it's my story, and it was pain, really painful at the time. I'm 23 years old. I'm a pastor of the small church, just trying to do what's right. I didn't know how to lead well. And there was a woman in the church whose life was miserable. She and her husband, it was toxic, their marriage. They had two kids. I learned later, both of them had been abused by the husband. Both of them had debilitating sickness. And Part of the problem was because of the sickness, it led to severe obesity. She was miserable all the time. And every three months, I would get a call from Dolly. She's since gone to be with the Lord. She would rake me over the coals. We're not talking about a short conversation. It would last for 45 minutes to an hour. The language she used was vile. The accusations she leveled were they were not true. And after about the third time, every three months, about the third time, I went to the leaders of the church and I said, what do I do with Dolly? And they go, we don't know. We've tried to deal with her for years. They were no help for me. So finally one day, when Dolly was in a better place, I just asked her straight up, hey, every three months, you just rake me over the coals. You, you verbally abuse me. Why do you do that? I never could have guessed her honest answer. She just kind of said, yeah, I, I know I do that. Here's why. I am always in pain. 
And sometimes I'm so mad at God, but I, I can't get to him. So I take it out on you. Believe it or not, that, that honesty actually really helped me. I, I'm not encouraging you to imitate her, but I, I'll tell you what came out of it. I, I got a rule of life. I try to live by it as best I can, is that when others are at their worst, I have to be at my best. And what I discovered was when I was at my best, when Dolly was at her worst, I was able to absorb her pain. And not only did that bring healing to her, she got off my back. There's something powerful about moving past your own pain to the future progress that you can gain from it. I, I would say it this way. We're either gonna make ourselves miserable or we're gonna make ourselves strong. And the amount of work is about the same. Carlos Castaneda. That's a brilliant quote. You have a choice right now to sit in the pain that you're in or move to a future that you know God is going to bring. And that future may involve you absorbing pain so that others can be healed. The problem with pain in the present is my pain always seems random right now. I'm sure that Joseph felt his pain was random when he was sitting in the pit, when he was sitting in the, in the prison. But if you can get past your present pain, then you can see that your pain ultimately will have a purpose. That's the first thing. Here, here's the second. Look past the pain that others have caused. Again, I, th I think about uh, where, where Dolly was with me. When I began to recognize how much pain she was in, when Joseph began to recognize my brothers treated me that way because of the way my father treated them. When you can look past the pain that others are putting on you right now and, and look at their past, their injury, then all of a sudden it's not the pain that others have put on you, but it's actually the pain that others have put on them. And you become like Christ to bear the pain that others put on you see them for not what they're doing to you, but what was done to them. And then your pain can have a purpose. The, the third change of perspective is with God. We need to look not at right now what God is doing, but his past faithfulness of God. It's not hard to, to count. E even for Joseph, he had the dream. And the dream wasn't fulfilled in the way he thought it would be. But ultimately, God brought good out of every pain that he bore. He will do that with you as well. And I would just encourage you right now, instead of sitting in the pain and saying, well, God is absent. Where's God? I'm hurting. Where is he now? Look at where God has been. And really, that's the, that's the tip of the spear for this message. As a takeaway, we want to offer you an opportunity to do in your home what we typically do here when we gather for service. And that's to take communion. You know why we do that? Because when you remember the faithfulness of God, it puts your own pain in perspective. If you have a cracker somewhere in the house, maybe a cup of juice, maybe some wine, if you have those elements, go ahead and pull those out. If you don't, don't worry. We're gonna put some scriptures on the screen and you'll have a time just to meditate through the goodness of God. But here's what I wanna promise you. Through communion, when you see the, the cup and the juice, the, the symbols of the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus, you will be reminded that God never wastes a pain. Don't you waste a pain. And if you're in pain right now, leverage it for the progress of the future that God can bring through it because God will always take even the worst pain and bring it together for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Let's take some time to look back, not just look around, to look back so that we can see what God can do in our futures.
Let's pray. Holy Father, we receive in this moment these symbols of the body and blood of Jesus. We receive the sacrifice that you made for us in hopes that what you will do through us for the salvation of others. With grateful hearts, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, thank you for tuning in and for being a vital part of CCV. Let's go out and make Jesus famous.